Canada's worst handymen have each designed an eco shed, but only one of the five frames created in here would even pass a building code inspection, and three of these monstrosities are too tall to even go out the front door. Our builders have some serious decisions to make. Either they leave these things exactly as they are, or they renovate the frames before they get totally out of control. Over the course of this nine-show series, the five most atrocious amateur builders in the entire country will each completely construct a shed using environmentally friendly building supplies. This is not paint, this is some weird eco product that okay. is the future of paint. Our bad handymen don't know that these sheds have already been auctioned off on eBay. The money raised is going to be donated to Habitat for Humanity Canada. And one of these do-it-yourselfers will be crowned Canada's worst handyman. I want to know how we're going to fix it. We didn't just drag these sawdust makers in off the street. They were nominated for our embarrassing title by you. Candace from Calgary was brought to us by her husband, Justin. I, I'm looking forward to sitting back, relaxing, and getting a couple of laughs out of watching Candace. Candace thinks she's a building expert. In your head, you're an expert, aren't you? I am. Because she's watched a lot of it on TV. I like watching Homes on Homes, Trading Spaces, Ty Pennington on Extreme Makeover, Designer Guys, Meg Ruffman, How Not to Decorate. Candace has almost zero hands-on experience. Oh my god. Is it supposed to make that noise? Yeah. Even so, she looks down on her husband, who's a construction worker. I don't mean he's stupid. Well, he's, I'm just saying I'm smarter than him. I work with tools. I work with my hands. He does sheet metal. Candace calls this her toolbox. She calls this a finished handrail. And she calls this a scale model of her future shed. I think it's not bad from the blueprint. Jeff from Mississauga thinks handiwork is typing on his Blackberry. His pal Fred can't take it anymore. The last time I saw Jeff pick up a hammer and use it would have been about 10 years ago. Jeff is a delicate flower with no calluses. He's got very soft hands. His hands are probably softer than mine. Are you sure the hammer's not going to slip out of your soft, moisturized hands? One way Jeff stays supple is by conveniently keeping his toolbox in a storage locker three miles from his house. The last time I went to get the toolbox from the storage locker was... Pick a decade. When Jeff finds a home repair problem, he sometimes sticks with it. This is the hole in the wall that I fixed by using masking tape. And sometimes does nothing. It's been like this for about five years. We have the door, uh, we have the hinges, um, just don't know quite how to put the hinges on the door. Ruth was nominated as Canada's worst handyman by her daughter, Michelle. This is my cupboard door that I made. But it won't stay shut for some reason. At home in Capel, Saskatchewan, Ruth is a fearless builder. She tackles projects even if she has no idea how to do them. She's built her deck, she installed a fan, she's done her tub surround, she built shelving, all of the painting, her counters, her cupboards, her anything. And for Ruth, safety is rarely a concern. Ow, ow, ow. You it. The next nominee for Canada's worst handyman is Terry. This is my birdhouse. Mm. <laughs> Terry was made a candidate by his buddy Harv. You son of a bitch, I heard. At home in Sault Ste. Marie. This is the ultimate man shed. Terry has a shed full of tools he doesn't know how to use. I bought a... Uh... What's that thing called, Harvey? It doesn't matter. Terry's slanted shed isn't for working in. It's for drinking beer in. Every man should have a, a shed like this because it's a home away from home. Translation? It's a home away from his wife, Angie. And I can look in the mirror and see my wife coming down the sidewalk. She asked me, honey, what are you doing? Oh, nothing. <laughs> Heine, our last candidate, was nominated by his mother-in-law, Sheila. My mother-in-law lives three blocks away. Door's not done yet. She's always here. And she's always ready to talk about how inept time he is. Drywalling's not finished. Windows need to be sealed, trim around the ceramic. The list goes on and on and on. Jaime and his family moved into this fixer-upper 
three years ago. There's a mountain of work here. Jaime needs to become a better handyman to save money. Fix these stairs. And to get Sheila off his back. He's a man. He should know some of these things. In our debut episode, the candidates for Canada's worst handyman tried to hook up to the water supply. The main water supply. Precipitation. On the roof, they pooled their talents together and made this kind of abstract funnel, which directs rainwater into this blue bucket. But when they finished... Drill it right about here. I think it's right down here. Jaime inexplicably drilled a hole in the bottom of the barrel. That's not a bucket anymore. Today, he and I head back to the scene of the massacre. What are you thinking putting a hole in the bottom of your bucket anyways? To see if we can patch things up. This is a trick that I learned from a uh, fisherman at home. To seal plastic, get a blowtorch, some pliers, and a piece of steel. When the metal's hot enough, lay it in place and quickly cool it down before it melts through. Now that's bucket surgery 101. The eco-friendly water this barrel catches will be used in future projects. Nice. <laughs> Because he was named most improved in our opening episode, Jeff is the foreman of today's group challenge. You have Canada's worst handyman. You have a pile of reclaimed bricks. You have a few bags of pre-mixed mortar. And you have some water that's collected through your guy's funnel. I'm sensing either a brick barbecue or a disaster set in stone. Make me a barbecue. Jeff lists his occupation as a management consultant. So, as a foreman who's never done any brickwork before... There's instructions on the bag. You'd think he would manage to consult the instructions. Instead... But you got to leave a space. Jeff begins by guessing. No, I don't, I don't think there's a space. Incorrectly. No, there's no space. I'm not a dictatorial type of leader, although my staff may differ. I, um... Jeff tells his workers to start by placing a layer of brick at the bottom. Do you want to kind of look at the picture they have here to lay bricks? To build a brick barbecue, you can go with any pattern you want, as long as it involves plenty of mortar, ample ventilation, and a way to balance the grill. A traditional three-walled structure is easy and effective. Just be sure to make every row level and straight. Turn to look good. This is looking pretty good. But this bone-dry, gapless foundation doesn't look good at all. Do we need a base? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm making a call that this is our base. Jeff should call for the instructions. Then he'd know that masons always wet bricks thoroughly before laying. This mortar will dry hard to itself, but dusty bricks. That's not straight. Jeff needs help. Cement bonds to things by getting inside it and then hardening, right? If you dip the brick in water, it's going to draw some of the cement in better and you'll get a far better bond. So, wet bricks are now being mortared to the loose bed of dry ones. So do you think we used enough down here to hold that firmly? Oh, the bottom I think we're fine. Yeah? Jeff isn't fine anywhere. You put more butter than that in a slice of bread for a prisoner. As a verb, the word butter means to put mortar on bricks. The instructions say that you should lay bricks into position after buttering the end. Jeff doesn't do that. And he really doesn't lead. If a good team succeeds, you don't know there's a leader. This team isn't succeeding. Some of their mortar is too thin and some's too thick. These bricks are not straight. Getting bricks straight doesn't take rocket science. It takes a torpedo level. We gave Jeff one for setting individual bricks. He hasn't touched it or his long level. I don't know what happened here. Bricks are not the same size. Jeff is allowing mismatched bricks to be stacked between layers of now crumbling mortar. So this is starting to get a little bit harder to work with now. I'm sure this is never going to work. This cement's too dry. Jeff should know why we gave him one of these tools. It's called a pointing trowel. Doing it is called pointing. You've seen brickwork has that nice smooth run like that? Yeah. Do you want to point away? While Jaime points, Terry ventilates. Now we're going to put a hole so it can breathe. Yeah, I know what, you know what you're saying. Yeah, I do. So do we put it like this here, here, or like that? That won't hold it. No. no. Maybe put a brick in there with holes standing up. 
Was that going to achieve the draft? Not really, but it looks good. It won't look good for long. Now it's draft year. I like it. Okay, good. Brought some visitors. And the visitors aren't impressed. <laughs> Shouldn't it be wetter? You guys building a chimney? What's that hole in there for? Is That's that for air. Oh, you guys are brilliant, eh? That's enough from the off. peanut gallery. Does anyone have any positive input for us here? I sure wouldn't want a foreman like this guy around. Mr. Foreman, why is this not level and why have you never checked it with a level once? It's part of my design concept. I was going for the eco slash artistic slash rustic look. Going for the professional look, Jaime attempts to finish level. Let me just put some more cement on here. Jaime, you're going too high there. But it's too little, too late. It's so pointless, Jaime doesn't even bother to finish. How did this go, Mr. Foreman? I think it went well. Nominators? I think as a team, we worked great. Jeff's barbecue is toast. After the break, we'll go ringside for a battle between lightweights. Since getting to our rehabilitation center, most of the nominees for Canada's worst handyman have been bonding. Anybody got a smoke? But Jeff and Ruth have been cultivating a rivalry. There are there are there are no there there are no issues between me and any other cast member. That may be Ruth. Before Jeff even met the other candidates, he felt superior. I'm um, smarter than them. Oh, he's an ass. Yeah. I am smarter than the rest of them. He's a hose's ass. Not necessarily better, but smarter than the rest of the candidates. He's a Them's fighting words. Jeff issues a challenge. One nail. Least amount of strokes wins, loser goes home. It's a showdown of epic proportions. In the blue, the aggressor, Jeff, soft hands, Janak. And in the white, it's Ruth, the half pint summer sides. Fastest one to countersink the nail. On your mark, get set. They start in a frenzy, and they stay that way. It's looking like a photo finish. Who won? I need to review tape. I have no idea. In the slow-mo replay, you can see Ruth make her final stroke while Jeff needs two more smacks. Jeff is the loser, and Ruth is the worst champion. Bye-bye. Jeff really got a nice case of humble pie handed to him. Everyone was cheering because he is kind of arrogant. I actually contend that I won. He is so arrogant. I actually gave several extra hammer strikes to, to prove a point. Before Canada's worst handymen can move on to wiring their eco sheds, they need to redesign their frames correctly. So our head rough carpenter, Jill Rydell, is explaining it to them. We've got some big issues with your sheds. Jill has been teaching carpentry for 14 years. His design is really, really sad. It sucks, actually. Jill's right-hand man here at the rehab center is Greg House, a general contractor with 24 years of professional home building experience. You guys don't know how hard it is watching you make hamburger with screws. Together, Jill and Greg teach classes. Less wood, more insulation. It's always better. Answer questions. Mix water to powder. Water to powder. And join me at the end of every episode to determine who is the most improved handyman and who is the worst. Okay, let's talk about basic framing principles. After this class, our bad builders will redesign their existing shed frames. The wall system, you can make them shorter. You want to make the roof higher, that's up to you. The big reason we're teaching this class is to get Jaime, Candace, and Terry to shrink their sheds. This is awesome. When everyone designed their frames, they were given a maximum height. Your shed's overall height must not exceed nine feet. Nine feet, two inches. But Jaime's shed is almost 11 feet tall. You knew that you were breaking this rule? Yeah, kind of. Candace's is taller. It's a lot of lumber for something called an eco shed. Yeah. 
And Terry's is even taller. I don't see nothing wrong with it. That's an awesome shed. You could make two stories, six feet, six feet. You know, put the tools on the bottom and like a little uh, room upstairs with TV and all that other stuff. That'd be awesome. Jaime's redesign doesn't lower his shed the crucial two feet. Bring it down 10 inches. 10 inches? Jaime thinks our height restriction is just a made-up number. He doesn't realize it's the height of our warehouse door. I'm still over by uh, one whole foot, so... So, he'll have the same problem as Terry. Keep it eight feet the way it is, and the roof will be a foot peak. That's a total of nine feet tall. But Terry's forgetting about his eight-inch subfloor, which means his final design is six inches higher than our door. Ruth's tiny shed frame doesn't need to be redesigned at all, but she suddenly has height envy. Make these walls eight feet ten. Uh huh. That raises the roof almost three feet, meaning our shortest candidate will wind up with the tallest shed. Might be a little high. Jeff's shed lacks studs and height. So for his redesign, I'm figuring maybe another stud. And he's figuring on more wall height. Nine feet from the ground then. Nine feet plus the six inch roof means Jeff shed keeps the streak going. All four redesigned sheds are higher than our nine foot two height restriction. Candace's original fortress of studs is also too tall. For her redesign, Candace wants to keep one wall stud for every three she gets rid of. Gone, 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 gone keep, gone, gone, yeah. gone, gone, keep, gone, yeah. gone, gone, keep. And for her roof? I would like to bring it down one foot instead of three. Making Candace's future height nine feet. It is pretty sturdy, so I think it will turn, the finished project should be pretty nice. Okay, thank you. Thank you. When the reconstruction is done, Candace's shed will be the only one low enough to fit through the door. While our building team gets to work altering the shed frames, the handymen move upstairs so we can find out how knowledgeable they are when it comes to standard tools. Uh, um, um, not a cheese grater. This coping saw is used for delicate slicing. Um, <laughs> not sure. Wood saw? A uh, small hacksaw? This dull-edged bevel is used for measuring angles. Kind of like an exacto knife sort of thing? No, I don't, I don't really know that one. I have no idea what that is. I know what that is. That's a level for your, uh, um, the peak of your roof. That's the worst answer. The worst person is Jeff, who only recognizes three of the 11 tools. After the break. I don't think that's how it works, Mom. The bad builders adjust and readjust. If we didn't have a time limit, you'd be here all day. If you're extremely bad at home repair, you're still better than these people. The country's most talentless amateur renovators are in Toronto, building eco-sheds to see who is Canada's worst handyman. To get electricity into these eco-sheds, we're giving everyone solar panels and today's first project. Your next challenge is going to be building a frame for your solar panel. Take a good look at this and make one. One solar panel is able to capture enough energy for two light bulbs and two standard wall outlets. The tempered glass can withstand golf ball sized hailstones and lucky for us, these photovoltaic cells work better in cold weather. Before the bad builders start swinging their hammers, they all descend on the prototype frame looking for inspiration. To complete this 20 minute job, we're giving them each an hour to go from concept to construction. You measure. I'm not doing that for you. I can't do it without a diagram. Then draw it. Good plan. First, the frame needs a bottom. Then screw on the upright back pieces. When attaching the brackets, make sure this angle is exactly 60 degrees. Then add a top piece for strength and you're done. Okay, so which section do you think we should build first? Terry starts by measuring the base and marking its length on his own board. I'll go double check. Well, how'd you mess that up? What the hell? I'm we'll just put a squiggly mark through that. Instead of a line, Ruth barely makes a dot. And Jeff's cutting guide is made by Fred. You gotta measure something, don't you, or have you? Here's a saw. To saw the lumber, oh, Terry uses his handsaw. 
Oh, come on. Ruth uses her jigsaw. Watch your fingers. I will. And Jeff uses Fred. There you go. Did you mark it? Yeah. Now the fun begins. That's not straight. That's not straight. That's not straight at all. Just draw a line. You could, you could use anything to draw a line. Every handyman has one of these combination squares, specifically designed to draw perfect perpendicular lines on lumber. Ruth is finally trying to use hers. Oh, Mom, you're not doing that right. You want to do it? Just draw a straight line. All right, all right, I got you. But you're not doing it right. The first time we saw Candace cut a piece of wood, it took her, wait for it. We're going to be here all day if I do that. Five minutes. Today, she's letting her husband do the work. Let the saw do the work. I pressed too hard on it last time. Justin takes over, leaving his wife as a witness to her own project. But Candace doesn't see that these two boards have been cut too short. Ruth is doing her own work, but screwing takes a while. A long while. In. Before screwing anything, Harvey correctly uses the square to make sure Terry's base is really a rectangle. Terry doesn't look too busy there. No, uh, his hand, his, his nominator looks very busy. Usually the field test is pretty good. I mean, you better look again. Make sure you're doing it right. So do you want me to hold yeah. this hand here? Yeah. Oh, I was supposed to wait till you told me what to do. Hey, this is a bit twisted or are my eyes twisted? As Terry gets close to the end, he rushes and makes a mistake. Hold this flush. He puts the cross piece on his bracket before it's at the correct angle. Keep going, Herb. What do you mean? I got the thing right there. This has to come out more. Some didn't work out, did it? Terry's frame isn't at the correct angle. It has to come this way, so. Every day, the sun's trajectory changes. So for optimum light collection, the solar panel's angle should be flatter in the summer and steeper in the winter. Today, the perfect angle is 60 degrees. Terry is under the delusion that close enough is good enough. There. Got it? You're done. Terry's first angle isn't 60. That's off a degree or two. And his second is worse. That's a big difference. We're going to have our 60 degree angle. To help them get that all-important 60-degree angle, we've given everyone a speed square with a T-bevel. And they are causing confusion. I don't think that's how it works, Mom. I don't know. Is that 60 right there? So we'll just go like that, I guess? She guesses? No. This speed square replaces guessing. When positioned in any corner, the movable arm can be adjusted to read the exact angle. It's the adult version of a protractor. I don't know how to work that. So how are you going to check it? I haven't a clue. How do you use this freaking thing? See right in here? Yeah. That tells you the degrees? Yeah. yeah. You said you need 60. So now you take this down here, sit it flat, just yeah. like that, and that's not quite 60 degrees. That's not quite 60? No. OK. When Jaime gets everything readjusted, Man. it's still not 60 degrees. Meanwhile, take your time. Jeff is relying on Fred to constantly tell him the obvious. Keep your weight on it. Come over a bit. Toss it in the bucket behind there. I'm trying not to put the screw through my thumb, OK? Even with Fred's help, Jeff's frame is off kilter. But Jeff doesn't care. There's a, it's a fraction of a thing, but I'm sure. You want to rebuild it? As a solution, Jeff sticks in a loose wedge. Fred saw the wedge, and he made the wedge. Jeff fails to take responsibility for his own irregularities. Jaime is measuring. Again. What are you doing on the unit? Yeah, I'm going to move it here. How many times is it now, really? At least three. If we didn't have a time limit? You'd be here all day. All the other uh, contestants, they were they were getting some help, and I, I didn't think I was getting any help. I thought I thought I was beating egg bent. Eventually, Jaime runs out of things to adjust. I think it's right. It is right. In just under an hour, Candace is perplexed. We have 60. That's 60. Right, oh. right on the line. You can't have anything different. It's so close. 
It's close. It's not right, though. Candace must never have seen a tea bevel on a home renovation show. What's going on with this gap here, Candace? I'm trying to figure that out right now. This has to be down. That angle. I'm trying to use my angler. No. Pop those screws out. Following Harvey's orders, Terry gets perfect angles. That's 60. Terry's done in just over an hour. But Harvey did all the thinking. If I hadn't have been there, it wouldn't have turned out the way it did. Are you going to measure that first to make sure it's 60 degrees? No? She fully admits that she doesn't know how to measure properly. Ruth thinks she's done. Ta-da! But she's not. I want to see that flush. She didn't measure properly. The angle's not right. Instead of fixing her work, Ruth goes for a wedge. That's it. It's a stake in the heart of Ruth's project. Whoa! All right, that's good. Just clack it on. Clack it. Beautiful. That's not beautiful. And it's not what we asked for. The last person working still can't figure out where to put the speed square. I go this way? Finally, Justin shows her. That's it? Yeah. Candace has a proper frame, but she has no idea how it got that way. After the break... Why can't we just run an extension cord? The handyman get a shocking lesson. White on white, black on black. No sparky sparky. To find Canada's worst handyman, we're having the five candidates you nominated build ecologically friendly sheds. But four of them have asked us to start them off with frames that are too tall to get through our workshop door. When these sheds are finished, we're donating them to Habitat for Humanity. In fact, they've already been auctioned off sight unseen. So if you bought one of these things, um, Sorry. The next step in shed construction is wiring. Before that can happen, though, the handymen need a lesson. Basically, the theory of electrical is the flow of current. Positive power, black. Negative power, white. To achieve flow from a light switch to a light, to another light, and back again, you need to connect the color-coded wires. White on white, black on black. No sparky sparky. Okay, so let's look at the process of what you're gonna do. First, you're gonna install your boxes. And there's your box, and you just nail it right into the two by four. This rectangular box is for the light switch. For the light itself, use an octagon box. The octagon boxes are installed with screws. Wire your two white wires together, white on white, black, black. Goes through into this box. When you get your fixture, black on black, white on white. When the sun hits one of these solar panels, the captured energy will be transferred to these car batteries. When it's needed, the weak current from those batteries flows through this inverter where it becomes more powerful. I don't even know where to start. If Canada's worst handymen start at the right place, this job should take about an hour and a half. To make sure they all have an easy time with this task... I have no idea what this all is. We've given our builders a detailed schematic drawing of the perfectly wired system. If they can connect the dots, they'll have a constant supply of free power. If they can't connect the dots, they won't be able to juice up their rechargeable tools. My battery's going. Let's do it. Jeff begins by installing his boxes. Incorrectly. In class, Jill told everyone to extend their boxes past their studs by a... Half inch. Jeff's box isn't extended at all. And Jaime's extends too far. This needs to be an inch and a half out. Is it supposed to stick out like that? Oh, that's good. Ruth installs her light switch higher than her own head. Think, think, think. Ruth doesn't think. Her light fixture boxes go on the wall, meaning her lights will shine right in her eyes. I can't see. My glasses are fogging up. 
Jaime puts his box on the very bottom of what's called his ridge board. He's just creating something that's going to be ugly. Because Jaime and Terry both failed to recess their ugly boxes, they're going to have to look at them even after the lights are installed. It's just confusing. I've never done electrical, ever. This is so confusing. I don't understand this at all. I don't even, this is it's so confusing. While Candace looks for inspiration. Boy, the wiring is gonna be not that bad, I think. Jaime, Terry, and Ruth begin drilling holes to run their wires through. This is the slowest drill I've ever used. Maybe you're going in reverse, Mom. I'm not in reverse, Michelle. Not anymore, she's not. I'm seeing daylight. Using the same technique, Jeff tries valiantly to drill a hole for over a minute. Sure, take a shot. You're in reverse. These holes may look like they're compromising the wall strength, but according to building code, one-inch holes are fine provided they're in the middle of the stud. There, the wires inside can't be pierced by a nail or screw. Heaven forbid you do drill a hole in the wrong spot, you can get this, a protector plate. Put it over the wire, nail it down, and now no nail will ever strike the wire. After staring at different objects for the last half hour, Candace finally has a glimmer of understanding. Yes. Oh. 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 Yes. oh. And she begins by nearly breaking her husband's thumb. Can I get you to hammer it? While Justin does the work, Candace gets her ladder. You ever work one of these? Oh, you got it locked in. These articulating ladders. I don't want it up here. Can be positioned. It's the middle you have to bring up. I know. Into eight. Just yes, wait. Hang on a minute. Handy configurations. Oh, I want to stand. Stand on like a scaffold. And dozens of dangerous ones. Like that? You're gonna fall right between. You're gonna hurt yourself. Oh, what's the weight on this ladder? <laughs> you son of a. Injuries resulting from bad ladder use cause over 8,000 emergency room visits per year. And that's just in Ontario alone. Hundreds more go to the emergency room because of accidents with electricity. It kills. That's what Jill says. Remember, electricity kills. Terry needs to know this. Back in Sault Ste. Marie, he put substandard electricity into his man shed. You've wired your own shed before. What an extension cord, not like this. <laughs> Why can't we just run an extension cord, it'd be easier. When running wires, oh no, always cut off more than you need. Are we short? Things too short. Hey, did you measure that? Because last time you cut too short. Mom, look what you did. What did I do? You cut the wire. And don't peel back the protective insulation before threading it into a light box. It'll get stuck. Some of these boxes have to move. Think about why this is wrong. I know it's why it's wrong. I didn't know how to fix it. Your ceiling cover is supposed to come flush with this, right? Are you using there a two-inch ceiling cover? Okay. Harv! What? That's you. Terry raises the box, but forgets to let half an inch stick out. Does that have to be flush, or does that have to come down a bit? No, it don't have to come down a bit. No? After 57 minutes, Ruth has managed to run a few wires. What are we doing? I don't know what I'm doing. But that's all she's managed to do. Did you put your ground on? No, I'm trying to pull up there so you get that one. Oh, well. The ground wire is the bare copper wire that runs alongside the black and white wires. You have to make sure the ground wire goes around the green screw head in any octagon box. Otherwise, you'll be the one who screwed. When the ground wire gets attached to every box, it should be run literally outside to the ground. Its function is to carry away any excess power that might otherwise electrify the light fixture itself. I don't know where the ground's going. I'm guessing this is the ground here? It doesn't sell me. Uh, no. I'm not sure where the ground is. We've got a problem. Terry can't get the ground wire on his light switch. What's the problem? We got a black and a white in the ground. What I was thinking is put another wire up there, bring it down here, and then you have two black, and then you have two white, and then you just ground it right here. You know what I'm saying? No, I don't. 
but I do know that you should never attach a black wire to a white wire. So I just wire the switch up uh, a black and a white Is that, and ground it out? Would have to be one hell of a ground if you're going to attach a black to a white. I know. <laughs> Junk. Yeah. Jaime has attached a black to a white. What the heck are you doing? I have to untwist this one. Which completely twists Sheila. Does that look right to you? I didn't take electrical. Did you cover it in class? I didn't go to school. I think Jaime's mother-in-law's driving him right up the wall. Any tools you need now, you have to jump down and get them. I'm done. Okay. So I quit. I'm out. Sure, You're, if you want to be out, if you don't want to help, then well, why, why be there? I can't help somebody who doesn't want help. He wants you to turn screws for him. He wants you to do things for him, but you're denying... Turn screws for him? I don't think so. If I can't get in there and do it, then I may as well leave. I refuse to help somebody who doesn't want to listen. After the break, we'll find out who's charged up oh. and who's in the dark. Please make it work. The nation's most confused carpenters are even worse at wiring. These people are trying to get solar power flowing into their eco sheds. They're also trying to not be named Canada's worst handyman. But both of these have to be moved over yes, here. I'm doing that now. This is really confusing, this electrical, I tell you that much. To make this project easy, we've given everyone a detailed schematic of the correct way to wire their sheds. I don't know where that goes. This here goes to the solar panel. You got, got this hooked up wrong. Ah! When Terry gets all his connections made, his fuses installed, and his bulbs screwed in, he connects the heavy gauge wire that will run from the panel to the car batteries. We'll bring those batteries in for the test later. Good job, brother. Good job, brother. I think we did pretty good. Trying to screw in her light, Candace spins the bulb until it snaps off in the socket. I was trying to screw it in. How many bad handymen does it take to screw in a light bulb? What the hell? Justin finally sees the problem. Oh, and you broke it. How did I break it? You broke it. One of those lights? 90 bucks. Oh. Energy efficiency comes at a price. Does it ever? The price for each of these solar panels is over $1,200, and the inverter panels cost $425. When you add on wire, light bulbs, and other expenses, the overall cost of free electricity is $2,300. That doesn't allow for errors. This will be the dark corner of your shed. If you find yourself with a dangling bulb, turn the electricity off and use pliers to sever the wires. Then get a potato. Cut that bad boy in half, then use the cleaner. It'll be jammed right on there and watch this. The light bulb should, yes, come right out, safe. Ah! Candace is nowhere close to getting electricity to flow. This has to hook up here. I know that. But the tears are about to flow. Don't sit there and shake your head. What do you want me to do? I don't know. Justin doesn't want to see his wife cry, so he bites the bullet and finishes wiring Candace's shed for her. Call Andrew, because I think you're done. Done! When Jaime's done, he goes onto the roof and connects all the solar panels and runs the wires back into the warehouse. By the time the batteries get logged in and hooked up to the waiting systems... We're gone. Yeah. Jeff finishes, but not Ruth. We're in a torture no. chamber, yes. With one flick of the switch, we'll know if Jeff's shed is wired correctly. Please make it work. Hmm. After two hours and 45 minutes of wiring, Jeff is still in the dark. Terry's next for the test. I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> Terry correctly wired his shed in a couple of hours. Although, his octagon boxes still aren't positioned correctly. True enough. Behind Justin is a broken bulb. Fire that switch. No. Candace has snapped off another one. And because her first bulb is broken, this second one won't light up. That's one of the problems with this kind of eco-wiring. Now, the bulb's changed, but... It still doesn't work. 
After two and a half hours of friction, Candace and her husband have no spark. The electrical was very, very complicated. Before Jaime's test, his switch is already up. Yeah, I put that upside down. Flip that switch, sir. Yeah! <laughs> Jaime made some mistakes, but his lights are on. Some of this went into that. While Ruth settles into her third hour of wiring... Hey, wait, 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 uh, that's gotta go here. I bring in the head of our lighting crew to see if he can sort out other people's problems. He finds Jeff's mistake in 20 seconds. Where were we dead? Oh, uh, loose connections, boys. Oh, I tight see. connections. You always have to have nice tight connections. There you go, see? In Candace's shed, he finds a fire waiting to happen. Was it connected to the wrong screw? Yeah. And in Ruth's shed, it's worse. Okay, I'm gonna feed this through for you. Our poor lighting guy has to spend half an hour disconnecting and reconnecting over a dozen mistakes. Black to black, white to white. In the end, he gets Ruth to light up. Yeah, it's on. <laughs> but we have to call her efforts a fail. Five bad builders are making five awful sheds. After the break, we'll name this episode's worst handyman. It's time now for the experts and I to take a final look at the work done in this episode so we can decide who is the most improved and who is the worst. This is uh, Ruth's shed, and it's got some issues. At the beginning of this episode, Ruth had the shortest shed. Now? She made it too high. And her fixtures are too low. She was too lazy to raise her lights up. Ruth didn't get the exact angles on her solar panel. I don't think that's how it works, Mom. She didn't complete her own wiring, and she needed answers to the simplest questions. Where's my drill? How can I have four wires here? Why is there two screws? Jeff's next. He also redesigned his shed so it's too tall to fit through our door. And he stayed with a flat roof. The snow stays on there, water stays up on there. There's, you gotta have some kind of slope. A flat roof, you, you can't waterproof them. It's gonna leak. In Candace's shed, the lights were put in the wrong places. Lights on the side, it creates shadows. It's supposed to be a workspace. These lights should have been on the uh, rafters because they're less likely to get damaged. I may be the worst again. <laughs> and it'll be very discouraging if I am. The biggest mistake made by Jaime this episode was not following our height restriction. He disregards instruction. It's an avoidance technique. And he is somewhat closed-minded. The final shed here belongs to Terry. It's also too tall. And when it comes to the work... Terry didn't do a whole lot of it. Yeah, I saw his nominator doing Quite a bit of the work. Yeah. And that work is not safe. It's exposed again here, right? You got this wire coming around. It's not tucked in. And the group project. Which should be rock solid by now. This is not a barbecue. This is a collection of bricks, right? This is not, there's nothing holds nothing together, held. right? No. Should this hold after a day? Absolutely, it should hold after a day. Taking instruction and taking responsibility. Not happening. It's time to take the tool belt back from Jeff and name this episode's most improved handyman. We almost canceled the announcement of the most improved this episode because, quite frankly, you all slid horribly backwards. In fact, only one of you renovated your shed in a way that falls within our building guidelines. And that person is Candace. Congratulations. <laughs> it's time to name the worst. The worst person this episode is the person who didn't do a single thing correctly, except beat Jeff. I'm talking about you, Ruth. I don't know. <laughs> Ruth got stuck with the worst this episode because of her bad craftsmanship. Ta-da! It's very crooked. Her inability to follow instructions. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, that's gonna go hit. And her big mistake asking us to raise her eco shed. Make these walls eight feet 10. Uh -huh. To a height higher than the door it has to leave through. Oh well. Yeah, she seems a little upset that she's the worst this week. I don't know what the hell I was doing. That's what happened. I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I have no idea. I don't know where to put any wire. 
I don't know if I'm going to cut it or what the hell I'm going to do because I don't know what I'm doing. If my mom keeps this up, she definitely is Candace's worst handyman. In fact, I think she is already. On the next episode of Canada's Worst Handyman. Oh! Energy efficient windows get framed. <gasps> Eco insulation goes in. And the temperature rises accordingly. This is the that pisses me off. White on white, black on black. No sparky sparky.